in india in india uh, first of all i would like to thank archana for her kind words and also i'd like to thank archana for moderating this event you have been a great help thanks a lot and also i would like to welcome each one of you to who are participating in this webinar i hope you will find this useful the topic for our discussion today is understanding the mind the vedanta way if you think about it mind is in this mysterious no one has seen the mind no one has tested it and people know very little about the mind but we all know it does exist because we have all the perception emotions and feeling in the mind so we do know it does exist but when you try to investigate the mind it's not easy it's not like an object which you can touch you can dissect and you can um, um, uh, investigate so what's the solution how do you understand the mind we have been very fortunate the indian sages the indian rishis showed us the way they shut their eyes they looked inwards they meditated and they contemplated and they used their mind to understand the mind that's the only way you can really understand the mind is using your mind there's no other way you can do it and they found a lot they documented their findings in the different scriptures and text of ancient india and we will be using these scriptures as the basis for our presentation today what we will be covering today in our presentation is the source of the mind evolution of the mind structure of the mind functioning of the mind states of the mind and control of the mind these are the topics we will be covering in our presentation today this topic understanding the mind is part of the book which i have recently wrote called science and vedanta it's a essay number 5 in that book in case anyone who have purchased this book can read this essay after this presentation to get a better understanding of the mind so let's get going let's understand the source of the mind so what is the source of the mind the source of the mind to understand the source of the mind you really need to understand what happens in the mind and once you understand what happens in the mind then you can extrapolate it backwards uh, to understand what is happening in the mind so what does happen in the mind we all know experiences as the the thing which happens in the mind we have experiences right since the morning when you get up and when you go to sleep and also when you are in the dream state we have a lot of experiences so the experiences come from the five senses it could be a visual experience it could be an audio experience taste a uh, touch smell experience and also we have experiences which are like daydreaming or which comes from your memory from internal memory and all this happens in the mind itself so experience is, is one thing which happens in the mind so we need to understand what this experience is actually experience if you analyze experience it has to have two components it must have awareness and it must have a form basically so without so awareness is a key ingredient of experience you if you have an experience you must be aware of it you just cannot have an experience and saying i am not aware of my experience it just just impossible so whenever you have an experience awareness of that experience is a must that's a prerequisite of an experience so experience must have a form so it's a, a very basic ingredient of experience is awareness then the form is the second component which is superimposed on the awareness to complete the experience as such and the form can vary it can be sometimes the form can be like i mentioned earlier from your senses it could be a form a visual sound the forms can vary when the form varies the experience varies but the awareness remains the same so these are two ingredients which are very key to an experience there and the other thing important to understand that each one of us have a mind you have a mind i have a mind every human being have a mind in fact every living being has a mind so each of these mind has the same has a experience there and each of these mind has both the awareness and the form so the question to ask is is that awareness in each of the mind same is it common awareness between all the different minds and you know all the minds are scattered all over the universe or maybe the god knows maybe in different planets um so the so the is that awareness common so that's a question which is very interesting to ponder and vedanta has been very clear that this awareness which is available in each mind is common in all the minds in fact that's not the focus of this talk but all the minds are in one location itself your mind my mind is all in one location 
So that's a not topic we will not going to discuss here, but just for throwing it in uh, to understand that all the minds are at one location outside the space-time fabric as such. So the question becomes, if the awareness is the same in each mind, we need to understand um, awareness in a better fashion. So let's focus on trying to understand what is awareness. Awareness must have three ingredients or three components. It must have a subject, it must have intelligence, and it must have an object. Just like water is made of hydrogen molecules and oxygen molecules, two molecules of hydrogen, and one molecule of oxygen gives you H2O. And when you have those two together, you get water. In the same way, awareness must have these three ingredients. It must have a subject, it must have intelligence, it must have an object. So these are the three ingredients which make up awareness. Let's discuss this in a little bit more detail. Wherever there's awareness, there must be a subject who's aware of the experience. The subject is the knower part of the awareness. Right now, you are aware of me talking. So there is a subject within you who's aware of that experience. And that subject is the knower part of awareness. There must be an object uh, which must be experienced. This is the object is the known part of the awareness. Right now, I'm talking. So I'm the, uh, my talk is the uh, sub object of the awareness part of it. And that's the known part of awareness. And the third component, there must be intelligence by which the subject gets to know the object. Intelligence is the knowing part of awareness. These three components is not something which is hanging around there. These are three ingredients, three uh, parts of awareness. So wherever there's awareness, it must have a subject, it must have an object, and there must be intelligence. There'll be no awareness if any one of them is missing. For example, if there are a subject, but there are no objects to be observed, there will be no, no awareness of that uh, in that in environment. Or if there is a lot of objects around, but there is no subject to see the object. In that environment also, there'll be no awareness. Or the other alternative is, there is a subject and there are a lot of objects, but there's no intelligence by which the object is connected to the subject. So intelligence also is a very ingredient, important ingredient of awareness. So wherever there's awareness, it must have a subject, it must have an object, it must have intelligence. Let's study this in a little bit more detail. It's giving, just to summarize again, uh, awareness is, has three ingredients. It has a subject, object, and intelligence. And there are three powers uh, within awareness. There's a power of the knower, the power of knower by which uh, the subject can know what the object is. That's a power within, within awareness. Then there's a power of known. Uh, the power of known is that the power by which an object is created or becomes an object. And the power of knowing is the intelligence by which the object is known to the subject, basically. So let's take an example to explain this in little, little bit more detail. Uh, the example one, I'm the seer seeing the tree. I'm talking this in a sentence to make it more, make the subject, object, and the uh, intelligence to come out, stand out. In this example, I'm the seer seeing the tree the ego part is the I am part. The seer of the tree is the subject. And the object in this case is the tree. And there's an intelligence, which is the power of seeing. And that power of seeing is within awareness. It is because this power, the subject can see the tree. If this power is not within uh, awareness, there's no way the subject could have seen the tree. You might say the eye provides this uh, function. If something falls in the retina of the eye and it is transmitted to the brain. But in, uh, in science, that's the end of it. It doesn't explain how the tree is seen by the seer. There's a decoding power with an awareness in the mind which decodes that signal, which is the tree and makes the subject see it sort of thing. And that is part of the power of seeing, which is within intelligence. A similar example, I'm the listener listening to music. Here again, the ego is I am. The subject is the listener of the music. The object is the music which is being listened. And there's an intelligence by which the listener can listen to the music, uh, to the music. So that power of listening converts the music so that the listener can listen to the music. And all this power is within, within awareness. So you can see right now, if I'm talking to you, 
all the three parts are there for you to be aware of this if you are aware of my talk there is a subject within you who is aware there is my talk which is the object and there is a power of listening or decoding that's the signal which is going there uh, of listening to you so awareness is not a simple thing awareness must have these three ingredients and it has three different powers so okay so we understand awareness so what is self awareness what does self awareness mean if there is awareness there must be a self who is aware and the self can say i am aware so there is a self who can say i am aware now self awareness is a very tricky concept to understand but a very important concept now when i say self awareness what does it mean it means the self is aware of the self that means the self is aware of itself so if i write a sentence if i have written out here self is aware of the self that's what self awareness means so if you see if you see the example we gave earlier here the self is the subject and the self is also the object out here and by which you can be self aware that means the subject is the self and the object also is the self and the self is aware of itself so you can see in that situation there is no duality it's non dual it's aditva it's homogeneous it is partless in which the self is the subject and the self is the object i can understand it's not an easy concept to grasp but you can just imagine a entity which is within you in which the self and the object and the subject are the same once when the subject and object are the same and the intelligence is within that self awareness it doesn't need anything else it is self shining it creates the awareness by itself it's like a self generator which creates awareness just one minute let me drink some water one minute so in self awareness the self is equal to the object self is equal to the subject and self is equal to the intelligent and the power of knowing the the power of known is equal to the power of the known and the power of knowing it's one entity it's homogeneous it's non dual and that is what is your inner core basically and that inner core is self awareness it's like a bulb shining within us and is radiating awareness vedanta calls this satchit ananda so we know that that's the source of everything in the universe is this self awareness that's the bulb which is inside you which is radiating awareness and this the self the awareness is self sufficient it doesn't need anything else so that's the basic source of everything the mind and everything else in the universe so let's see how the mind is created by self awareness evolution of the mind so how is the mind created we are our inner core is self awareness in which subject is equal to the object but we don't know this is a we don't know about this we are ignorant about this fact we have forgotten our true nature and moment we forget about true uh, true nature ignorance pops up ignorance pops up it covers the self awareness it covers the self awareness when we forget that we are subject and object what happens the subject and object become separate uh, our forgetting about our inner core in by which the non dual uh, subject is equal to object becomes dual in which the subject is in here and the object is out there so this simple fact sorry um uh, this one minute sorry uh so we forget that we are subject and object so once we forget that we are subject and object a duality comes up there this ignorance causes a separate of the subject object and this separation is becomes a duality just one minute just one minute sorry about that but strange but too our ignorance is the cause of the duality this duality which is caused by ignorance is the basis of the mind so let's understand the effect of ignorance on self awareness we seen that self awareness is full complete it doesn't need anything else 
But does ignorance have an effect on self-awareness? No, the self-awareness remains on uh, non-dual. It doesn't change. It is as though it has undergone a change to create the mind with duality. The classic example is given is the rope and snake. In twilight, when you're walking across, we see a rope appears as a snake. So this rope has always been a rope. So who imposes the snake on the rope? It is our ignorance which superimposes the snake on the rope. It is as though we have added the snake on the rope. The rope has always been a rope. When you shine a light on the rope, you'll find out there's no snake there. It's always been a rope there. It is as though we have uh, added a snake onto the, uh, onto the rope there. In the same way, our ignorance as though changes the uh, self-awareness into duality with a, a separation of a mind there. So the mind is as though created by self-awareness. The self-awareness doesn't undergo any change. It is full, complete, and it doesn't, it is shining radiate, uh, radiating awareness. It has no change at all. It is by as though the mind has been created by ignorance. So we can see that ignorance is the cause for the mind. So what is the structure of the mind? So we have now seen that our inner core is self-awareness in which the self is equal to object, object is equal to the uh, uh, subject, and subject is equal to intelligent. It has four different parts now. Now we have seen in, uh, as a physics student, when a light passes through a prism, it breaks up the light into seven different uh, 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 colors, the vibjor, violet, indigo, blue, green, yellow, orange, and red. In the same way, when the presence of ignorance, the self-awareness as though separates it out in four different components. The four components is the self becomes self, object, subject, intelligence, they separate out. The sakshi becomes the home of the subject. Manas becomes the home of the object. Buddhi becomes the home of intelligence. Ahamkara uh, is the home of this ego. And chitta is the home of the memory. Uh, chitta is also sometimes taken part of buddhi, but we are created a separate entity here of, uh, as the home of memory. So let's discuss each of these components now. These are four components which have been created, separated out from self-awareness into a mind. So the mind is a, is a creation from the self-awareness. So let's try to understand these four different uh, parts of the mind. Sakshi, Manas, Buddhi, Ahamkara, and Chitta. Sakshi is the home of the subject. Sakshi means witness. It witnesses to what is happening in the mind. And the subject and ignorance are superimposed on each other. We see that uh, this uh, super, uh, what you call this self-awareness interacts with the ignorance and it breaks into uh, four different parts. So the ignorance and the subject are superimposed on each other. The power of knower, which is within the subject is superimposed on the ignorance. So ignorance gets that power of the knower of, of, to become a uh, witness from the self-awareness, the power of knower, which is within self-awareness. So the Sakshi, which is there within you, is a seer, it's a listener, it's a feeler, it's a thinker. The Sakshi is a witness to whatever is happening in the mind. It's very important to understand the Sakshi has no ego. It's just a witness. It just watches. It just has no ego. Ego is, a, is ahamkara. We sometimes uh, confuse Sakshi or the witness uh, to be ego. Ego is entirely a different entity. Sakshi is an entity which just watches. It doesn't do anything. It has no ego. It has no likes and dislikes. Uh, it is just a simple uh, ego, which, uh, sorry, it's a simple witness to what's happening in the mind. That's what Sakshi is. It's the home of the subject. It has the power of the knower, which it adapts from the self-awareness. Then you have Manas, which is the home of the objects. So all the object making ability is within Manas it resides in the, uh, in the mind, in the manas part of it. It's like a Play-Doh. A Play-Doh can be manipulated to become any object. The Play-Doh can become a, a, a car, a Play-Doh, you can make a Play-Doh into a tree, you can make a Play-Doh into a person, you can manipulate the Play-Doh into any object you want. In the same way, the manas has the power um, when the input signals are coming from the five senses, it understands what it's it, and it becomes that object, basically. And these, Manas is connected to the five input senses. 
uh, uh, sense organs, the ear, the uh, eyes, the nose, the, uh, the tongue, and the skin. And we have also five organs of action. And the manas also is connected to your internal organs, all the subconscious organs like your mind, your brain, brain, heart, your stomach, all these organs are connected uh, to manas. They put their input signals into manas, uh, which, which, which has the ability to become that object basically. Buddhi is the home of intelligence. Uh, the power of knowing resides within buddhi. Buddhi has many different powers. The power of cognition, perception, which is the perceiving when you perceive anything, that is the power which is within buddhi. The power of imagination, daydreaming, creative thinking, all these powers are within buddhi. The power of logic, comparing, drawing interferences, discussion, all that ability which is there, that is all the circuitry which is within uh, buddhi. That's power of logic. For example, when you see a fire or see when you see smoke on the hill, and the, the, which you can't see, you assume there's a fire there. That is because of your interference, in, interferences you take and you use your logic to understand if there is smoke, there must be a fire. So all these are powers are within buddhi. Ahamkara is the home of the ego. Aham means I and kara means maker. So ahamkara is the I maker. In the presence of the ignorance, the self becomes the ego. So ego is equal to the self plus ignorance. So ego is also just a mental way. Even, for example, the other four things I mentioned, uh, the uh, sakshi, the what you call the uh, buddhi, all those are mental events, basically. Uh, even the ego is a mental way, but it massacrates as, as the self. It thinks it's a self because it thinks it it's, plays the role of the self. So, but ego is just a mental wave. It's not the real thing. It's just a wave. When you start hunting down the ego, you'll find that so there's only a self within you. There's no ego at all. The ignore, ego has come because of your ignorance. And if you remove the ignorance, what you'll find is just your real self, basically. So ego is just a mental wave, which is within you. Chitta is the home of the memory. Chitta is like a <clears throat> is made of the mind stuff. It's a subconscious mind. It's like a lake. When you have an experience, it is floating on the top of the lake. And once that experience is complete, it sinks down into the lake. And it creates an impression within that uh, lake. And that impression is stored within the lake itself. And each thought or each experience creates an impression in Chita there. And whatever you have uh, experienced is all stored in this memory bank, basically. For example, when you see an orange uh, for the first time, you will see the orange, the taste of orange, the color of the orange, the smell of the orange, all are stored in this Chita on the top. And then it sinks in as an experience into the memory part of it. Next time when you see a, a orange, suddenly all the parts of the orange will come up to the, uh, the, at the top of the lake and you'll remember that the color of the orange, you'll remember the smell of the orange and you'll remember the taste of the orange. So the chitta is like a, a hard drive in which everything, all the experiences are stored. So that's the uh, structure of the mind. The structure of the mind is that is the mind has been created by ignorance and the four parts of the mind of the self-awareness uh, creates the four different components of the mind. So how does the mind function? So the four parts of the self-awareness are sitting in four different departments in the mind. They have been separated out. In self-awareness, they were homogeneous, one part. And in the, in the mind, they're sitting in four different departments. The manas is sitting in the home of uh, the subject, uh, the buddhi is sitting separately, ahamkara is sitting separately, and the sakshi is sitting separately. But these four parts are obviously restless. They want to combine together to create that self-awareness there, the original state, which it was there in, uh, in your inner core. They want to reach that self-awareness and they want to combine together. The object in the manas, intelligence in the buddhi and the subject in the sakshi combine uh, to uh, create awareness. So, so there's a tendency for the mind to combine. So it is looking for objects. So the moment it finds an object, it can start combining itself to create that self-awareness there. 
So there's a tendency in the mind, in the mind to reach his original state of self-awareness by combining these four different, three different ingredients of the of self of awareness. Let's see how that happens. So it's a four-step process. One is the activity in the manas. We have seen that the uh, manas is has the power of the known and is present in the manas there. Manas is a very busy place. There are continuous signals coming from the sense organs. So this, uh, the manas is bombarded with different signals which are coming from your ears, eyes, taste. It's bombarded continuously and also from your internal memories, experiences. It has been bombarded with a lot of information. So what is coming from these sense organ organs is a, like a wire diagram. And then the power of known in the manas, it adds a software code to each of these input signals. It adds the, uh, the, uh, the body to uh, the uh, uh, signal. So it uh, completes what it stands for. So the software coding is added by the power of known within the manas to each of the input signals there. So once that happens in the uh, manas, it happens in the manas, the perception takes in the, in the, in the mind, in the manas, but the manas has no clue what these objects are. It has no intelligence. It has no understanding what have I created. It creates the uh, object based on what the input signal is coming from these, uh, from these five senses, but it has no clue what that object is. So manas needs help to decode the signals to understand what is that object there. So it passes out that signal to buddhi. Buddhi has the power of knowing. It decodes that signal and adds intelligence uh, to that input. It adds knowledge to that input. It's like a CPU, uh, which the processing in incoming waves from the manas is presented to the uh, central processing unit. And the output is by adding knowledge. It adds knowledge of what that object is, for example, if the tree is coming in the senses, uh, through the senses to Manas, Manas adds the software code uh, to the uh, input signal, but it has no clue that it's a tree. So the Buddhi uh, reads that uh, input signal and it adds, oh, this is a tree and it adds a knowledge uh, to that input signal. So what is coming out from the Buddhi is a signal which is made of knowledge. It's not easy to understand this, but intelligence is the output from the, uh, from the buddhi, basically. And the buddhi handles parallel processing. It's one of the fastest uh, CPU processor because all the input signals which are coming from, uh, this, uh, from the manas, it goes through this uh, parallel processing and adds knowledge to each of the signal which is coming there. It's like a self-learning uh, CPU. It can control and handle all routine actions. So it doesn't have to depend on any other device. For example, you're so used to stopping uh, your car at a red signal. So uh, when your mind is functioning, uh, watching music or listening to something else, you're talking to people and you see a red signal, you stop automatically. The buddhi gives the signal because the buddhi is a self-learning. It knows as the red signal, you must stop. So it stops automatically. So uh, buddhi is the one which adds knowledge uh, to all the incoming signals from the manas there. And the output signals from the buddhi are called vrittis. In uh, the technical word, uh, which is used in Vedanta, is a vritti. Vrittis are waveforms which are made up of intelligence as such. Then what happens now? Then we have ahamkara. Ahamkara is your uh, ego. It, it's always interface now. Vrittis from the sense organs, and chitas are presented to the ahamkara. Ahamkara has, can only handle one thought at a time. It's not, not like your buddhi, which does parallel processing. Ahamkara, which is your ego, can only handle one experience or one thought at a, at a time. So how does it choose uh, the, uh, the signal? One is that it has a choice of all the signals uh, which are coming from uh, buddhi. It can choose one of the signals. For example, you're walking down the road, and you see a beautiful rose, and then you focus on the rose. There may be a lot of background noise, but you ignore all the other signals, and you focus on the signal, uh, which, is the, uh, which is the rose you want to see and admire. So the ahamkara chooses the vritti. And sometimes the vritti chooses ahamkara. We have seen many examples when the vritti itself has got intelligence, it has got the power 
uh, to make an ahamkara do things for example uh, doctors have told us not to eat uh, uh, any sweets because that's not good for your health but when you go to someone's house and we see a nice uh, rajgulla or some uh, laddu and your hand goes automatically and picks it up and puts in your mouth it's you not wanting to do that but there's some power within you the vritti itself the power uh, creates that uh, makes the hamkara eat that laddu or the or that uh, rajgulla so what happens is here is that the vritti is always uh, modifying the incoming signal from ahamkara from from buddhi it like it adds its own like and dislikes because if you like something you add the liking and, and something which you dislike you want to avoid so the signal which is coming from the buddhi the ahamkara modifies it according to its like and dislikes for example today you are in a pretty angry mood and you have a signal coming from from the from the buddhi you will add the anger part uh, to that signal basically or there's something which you dislike uh, you may want to avoid that signal there so you may i'd say i don't like this so you may had a dislike so whatever signal is coming from uh, the uh, buddhi uh, the ahamkara adds a raga and dvesha it adds is likes and dislike is added to the vritti basically so the vritti is modified uh, by the ahamkara by adding both the likes and dislikes of uh, its its own internal things uh, it, it adds the likes and dislikes then what happens now the signal has been through uh, the manas so it has the subject part of it the, uh, the sorry the object part of it then it goes to the uh, buddhi the intelligence part is there added then it goes to ahamkara it has the uh, ego part of it as this uh, the self is added to it now it comes in the presence of the sakshi when all these three components comes in presence of sakshi magic happens awareness is created because all the different components ingredients are present to create awareness so awareness is created in this process it goes step by step it first the input signal goes into manas and then the manas passes it on to uh, buddhi buddhi decodes that signal and then the ahamkara adds its own dislikes and likes to that signal and when it comes in the presence of sakshi you have magic you have awareness and that's how the full process of the mind functions the awareness is created when all these four different components are put together but this experience is very momentary because the same thought same process is repeated again and again every time you have a new thought the same process is repeated now if you move your mind you say, then you select it. so once uh, uh, experience is over and then the same process is started with the next thought which happens in your mind so that's how the mind functions basically so the different parts of the of the self awareness are the different parts in the mind and when they combine together you have awareness and that's how awareness is created in the mind so that's the uh, the next part we want to discuss are the states of the mind the mind can experience has three modes of experiencing a thing it can experience things in the waking state it can experience in the dream state and it can experience in the dreamless or deep sleep state so these are the three states of the mind the waking state we are quite clear uh, we have discussed that in detail we have uh, the the, uh, the input signal going through the manas then to the buddhi then to ahamkara and then presence of the sakshi it becomes uh, the awareness there so that's what you see the external world there but in the dream state what happens there the five senses are not present there they are deactivated so you don't you don't see the external universe in the dream state because the five senses are go back into the original state they are not active at all so what is active in the uh, dream state is the chitta all your experiences which are within your uh, uh, memory part of it so they are uh, uh, they are created in uh, they come out and they create the dream state basically and in the deep sleep state none of this is available neither is the five senses nor is the uh, dreams are there so what is present in a deep state sleep is only ignorance so that's the only thing which is available in deep state is ignorance so that's why uh, there's only one experience you have that experience is of ignorance so the, because that's why you find a deep state to be blissful because the experiences are not changing it is one experience of ignorance and because there's ignorance you're not aware 
that it is of uh, ignorance sort of thing. Controlling the mind. So how does one control the mind? Um, that's a very important subject. Controlling the mind is not easy. The mind is like a wind and controlling is not easy. It keeps changing the mind, the thoughts. You try to focus on one thought, you will find that it is almost difficult to control your thought on one mind, on one thought basically, because it keeps jumping. It's like a monkey going from one thought to another thought. Desires pop up, it takes over the mind. So it's not easy to control the mind. So what's the solution? How do you control the mind? That's a very important subject. How do you control the mind? The only way you can, you can't force the mind to be controlled. It is just impossible. You try to force it, it will never be controlled. The only way you can control the mind is to purify the mind. So there's a full process in Vedanta which teaches how do you purify the mind. This is a seven step process. In fact, there are more steps, but I've just summarized this into seven key steps which are used in, uh, by, in Vedanta. The first step is Viveka, discrimination, Vairagra, dispassion, Shama, quietude, Dhamma, uh, self-control, Titiksha, uh, tolerance, Samadhana, mind that is understand correctly, Mumuksha is a desire for freedom. Let's briefly understand each of this one. Viveka is discrimination. So it's a discriminates, uh, you need to understand uh, to understand uh, the object, you need to understand what is real in this universe and what is unreal. That's very important. That's a discrimination need to understand what is real and what is unreal. So what is real in this universe? Uh, the definition of real in Vedanta is something which doesn't change over three tenses. It doesn't change in the present. It doesn't change in the past and it doesn't change in the future. So what is real in this universe? You will not find anything out there to be real because everything in the in this universe changes it had a birthday and it is going to die so it is not real as per the definition of vedanta even this universe was created 13.7 billion light years light years back and it is going to finish one of these days there so it is not real so what is real the real is the only self awareness within you is the only real thing in the universe and everything else around in that definition is unreal so the only the self is real, no objects are real. So we need to understand and discriminate and you need to understand that what is real and what is unreal in this universe there. Once you understand this discrimination of between real and uh, unreal, then dispassion and detachment is automatically born. So you or your approach to objects change. So one, you know, your, your real self is within you and everything else out there is unreal. Your approach to the objects changes. You will understand the value and the function of objects. Many of us, when we eat ice cream, you find happiness. A lot of people think or eating chocolates, they find happiness. But if you look at the ingredients of an ice cream, you'll never find happiness as one of the ingredients of happiness. Happiness is not part of the ice cream. It is something which you superimpose on the ice cream there. So you need to understand that ice cream is ice cream. There's nothing there in happiness because for example, if you start eating the first ice cream, you may enjoy it. But if you eat four or five ice creams, you will dislike it. Or if you have a sore throat, uh, you will not uh, like to eat an ice cream. So happiness is not part of ice cream. Happiness is lying somewhere else, it, which is within you. You need to understand that issue. So once you understand that happiness is a source within you, and not in the objects there, you will create a detachment to these objects. So once you have a source of detachment to the objects, your mind will quieten down with detachment. You will not be disturbed if you don't get an object or if, if you get an object or if you don't get an object, your attitude towards your objects will change. So that's your mind quietened down. Once you understand what is real, what is unreal. And if you can understand a detachment towards these uh, objects, your mind will automatically quieten down. But sometimes controlling the mind uh, by using this logic doesn't work. 
you need to be like a strict principal and you need to control your senses um, so that they don't get distracted. For example, if you are walking in front of a sweet shop and you have a soft corner for sweets, you need to make sure that you don't enter the sweet shop. So it's very important uh, to have self-control. That is necessary if you're not able to use the other style of using discrimination and uh, shama at, uh, uh, at style. The next step is tolerance. Tolerance is a, a step which we start uh, enduring hardship without complaining. That doesn't mean you don't, for example, you, it's a very cold day outside and you're feeling cold and your heater is not working. That doesn't mean you don't go and shut all the windows and try to make yourself warm by putting blankets. But in spite of that, if you feel still feel cold, you need to endure the tolerance. You need to have the tolerance uh, towards hardship without complaining. You, that, it means that you try to solve the problem, but if you're not able to solve the problem, you need to endure that uh, problem, uh, endure that tolerance. You need to have the tolerance towards hardship. And then the next step is, is to direct the mind towards your inner core. That's very important. You need to understand self-awareness. You need to understand Satchitananda. You need to understand the powers. You need to direct your mind towards your inside. Once you do that, uh, you will find that the objects outdoor will not trouble you. If you get an object or if you don't get an object, you will not trouble you. So you need to direct your mind towards uh, inside, to your inner core. And lastly, you must have a desire for freedom to have moksha. You focus your mind inwards. And once you focus your mind inwards, you will find that your attitude towards the objects outside will change. So it's very important to control and purify your mind. You need to direct your mind from outside objects towards your inner core. And if you do that on a regular basis, you'll find more peace. And once you have more peace, you can live in the universe in a much more happier state sort of thing. So that's my quick presentation today. Uh, the other aspects of mind, which I have not discussed here, but uh, they are very important aspects of the mind. They are discussed in the book. One of them is the mind is outside the space-time fabric. Each of the minds we have, we the body is in the space-time, but your mind is outside the space-time fabric. In fact, the mind is a starting point of the space. It's a very important concept. Uh, which is very difficult for science to accept, but that is a fact. The starting point of space is your mind because the T of zero of the space is your mind. We have discussed that in detail in my book. The other thing is that, like I mentioned earlier, all the minds are in one location. There's a unity of mind. There's a cosmic mind, uh, which is explained in Vedanta as Virat, and all the individual minds are part of the cosmic mind. And then the other important aspect is Mind is a projector. Mind is what projects the universe there. Science teaches there's a universe out there and then it comes into your mind. But Vedanta is very clear. The mind is, uh, the universe is within your mind and you project it outside. That's a very important subject. We have discussed that in detail in the book. The other thing is also time and energy are also part of the mind. Time, Kala, Vedanta has been very clear. Kala is part of the mind and energy also is part of the mind. So there's infinite energy available within self-awareness and part of this uh, uh, energy is available in the mind and that energy is used to project the universe out there. So all these aspects of the mind are covered in my book, uh, Science Meets Vedanta. Lastly, I just wanted to introduce my book. It's called Science Meets Vedanta. The book has 37 essays and it is, uh, has 345 pages. It's available on Amazon, Flipkart, also Barnes & Noble online. It comes as a Kindle book, Kindle Unlimited, paperback, and hardcover. And here is my contact. I'll just leave the screen open for a, a couple of seconds. Uh, if you want to ask any questions about this book or about this subject, you can send me an email at giant at staminteractive.com. S T A M interactive.com. With that, I would like to thank everyone for patiently listening to me. And now I will send it back to uh, 
Archana, and I'm going to stop sharing my screen. Yes, thank you, Jen. So we do have a few questions from people. So I'm going to first ask the question by uh, Mr. Ram Chandra. So it was not actually a question. He wanted the example of rope and snake. Uh, th there was there's some kind of a confusion he had. So he wants uh, to ask a, a question. So is that okay, Jen? Yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, Mr. Ram Chandra, please unmute yourself and ask your question, please. Yeah. Uh, good evening, sir. Uh, my name. Uh, this is Ram Chandra here from Bangalore. Uh, hello to all. Uh, hi to all uh, other panelists also. See, uh, the basic question is in the Rajasarpa uh, example, the Dushanta that you gave, the snake and rope. And in the one particular line, you said the subject is equal to object. So there comes uh, this example, it, it, it leads to a certain amount of confusion. Like there is a third person who sees the rope and assumes it to be snake. Now, once you say subject is equal to object, rope, rope itself cannot you know, uh, become an illusionary part of the itself saying that rope is seeing the snake. Or snake being an illusionary part of the rope because rope and snake both are jada here. They don't have their own kind of you know uh, the the innate or inner uh, energy to uh, do anything there. It is the third person. So when you say subject is equal to object, how do you try to convince yourself or any other person? Like. This example would be helpful to understand the subject is equal to object yeah. part. Yeah. Uh, your inner core is subject is equal to object. Um, if there was no ignorance, there would be no mind, there would be no universe. You would always, all of us will be self aware. In the same way, uh, in the snake rope example, if everyone had a torch and there was no toilet, uh, there was The snake comes up when ignorance is pops up, basically. When ignorance pops up, then you only have the snake. If there was no ignorance, you will have no, uh, uh, you will never have the doubt that there's a snake there. So same way, the mind pops up only when there is ignorance. If there was no ignorance, everyone was self-aware, there would be only Brahman, there would be only Satchitananda, and everyone would have been a part of that. There would be no world, there would be no mind. The mind pops up because of our ignorance. In the same way, the snake pops up because of our ignorance of uh, not seeing the rope there. We think it's a snake. So it's, uh, it's the ignorance which creates uh, the universe. It's the ignorance which is creating uh, the snake part on the rope. If there was no ignorance, there would be only the rope. If there was no ignorance, there would be only the self-awareness. There would be no uh, there would mean there would be no uh, a duality. It would be only non-dual, basically. Does that answer your question? Uh, uh, if I can continue the same question, because here in Raju Sarpa, the snake rope, and the, the person who is viewing that part, so there are three people are here. Yeah, so but the person this... he stamps on the uh, uh, rope, thinks that it is the snake. That's the third part, and rope is the second. Snake is the third, the person, the perceiver. He is the first person. Now, how would this first person abolish himself or completely dissolves himself with the rope? Or how would the snake dissolves inside this rope itself? Because rope itself cannot illusionize itself as you know snake. That's the question. Because no. three three observers are uh, objects are here, and all are jada. The observer. Uh, this the rope uh, sn it becomes a snake is superimposed by the observer which is the ego i'm not talking about uh, the the self awareness it's the ego uh, within uh, within you which superimposes that uh, the snake onto the onto the rope so it's the observer who creates the snake uh, the snake doesn't the rope doesn't create the snake it's the observer it superimposes there may be a, a next person to you if your two you and your friend is walking down he has a torch and he sees more light. He straight away sees as a rope, basically. He's not, he doesn't get fooled. You may be walking 10 yards ahead and it's a little bit more dark. Uh, you as an observer superimposes the snake onto the, uh, onto the rope. Your friend who may have a torch or maybe he's got better eyesight and he, uh, 
uh, doesn't get fooled and he sees a rope himself. He has no ignorance. It's the ignorance which is uh, which is within you which superimposes uh, this rope onto the uh, a snake onto the rope. So the rope doesn't do anything. The rope is lying by itself. It's the observer which superimposes the snake onto the rope. Yeah. I think uh, Archana, is he still there or? Uh, no, I think he's, to... he's, he's on mute. So I need to just let him know that he's on mute. Okay. Or we can go to the next question. Yes, yes. Uh, Mr. Dev, would you please unmute yourself and ask your question? Uh, you could read it out, Archana. Sure, sure. Uh, so, with the understanding, according to Advaita Vedanta, that Aham Brahmasmi Tatsvam Asi is indeed the final objective of all sentient beings. One moment, let me just look at it. Sentient beings, how does Karma Yoga fit into it, especially considering that these sentient beings are these days almost consumed in highly focused action? Jen, did you yeah. hear my question? Yes, I got it. Yeah, yeah, oh, yeah. All right. Great. <clears throat> See, um, karma yoga is like uh, what I was mentioning to you in last part of my talk is controlling the mind. You want to bring um, your mind uh, directly, uh, uh, moving your mind from uh, external objects to internal objects. There, one of the methods to do that is to do karma yoga. And when you do your karma yoga you are understanding that the action is not being um, done by your inner core. The action is being done by your ego as such. So you are trying to live within your inner core, uh, which is your real self. So the karma yoga is a method of directing your mind towards, it's again, a, one of the sty uh, styles of uh, directing your mind from outdoor objects to your inner self, the karma yoga. So you do your action with no uh, reward. You don't, you're not waiting for the reward of your action. You do the action because you're supposed to do the action irrespective of what result you get. You may get a good result or you may get a bad result and you accept both of them. If you get a good result, you are still okay. And if you don't get the result you wanted, you're still okay. So that's the attitude of karma yoga. And once you build that attitude, uh, you will find you are moving towards your inner core there. So it's a, a, a one of another methodology of, uh, one is the method which I mentioned to you of controlling the mind. The other method is to uh, control it by doing karma yoga. So you do your action and you're not waiting for your results of that action. What are the results are there? You accept it. The results may be good, you accept it. The results are bad, you still accept it. So that's an attitude you, uh, you need to build. It's very important to build, to have that, uh, to control your mind, to make your mind peaceful. I hope I answered your question. Thank you, Jan. Yeah. All right. Thank you, Mr. Dev. Uh, Mr. Sridhar TR has a question for you, Jen. Can the recording be shared? This recording be shared? Yes, definitely. We will uh, put it on YouTube. And uh, uh, you, would, uh, you need to send your email ID to uh, Archana uh, mm -hmm. so that we can... Uh, send you an email uh, with, the, uh, with the recording basically, or your WhatsApp message, whatever you can send, we will then, uh, uh, we will be putting it online shortly. All right, okay, fine. So now let's move to the next person. Mohan uh, asks, how do you turn the mind inwards? How do you focus on it? Mind is, um, right now, you, your mind is most towards external objects. Your mind day in, day, on, day in, day out is towards your external object. So you need to direct your mind inwards, means you try to find your inner core. You'll try to look for that pulp of awareness uh, within you, and you try to direct your mind inwards, basically. Uh, it's, sometimes it's not easy because you're living in a world where you have to deal with external objects. Uh, so it's... Uh, the method is used that when you're dealing with the external object, you deal with the external objects there. But when you have free time, uh, you try to direct your mind uh, inwards at that particular moment. Because you have your own obligations. You cannot uh, live without the obligation. But initially, uh, it's a strategy which you can follow by which you can 
uh, do only the inward uh, 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 direction when you have some free time. But once you are uh, more uh, understanding is better. Uh, the other method is to understand what are the objects made of. Like I mentioned to you earlier, all objects are made of uh, it, of uh, uh, what you call awareness and a form, basically. So every object uh, is made of awareness and a form. So basically, we are so used to focusing on the form part of the object. But if you focus on the awareness part of the object, you will find that the awareness is uh, every object in this universe is made of awareness only. So once you have that understanding that awareness is the ingredient of every form, then you can your attitude towards the objects will be different because you are looking at the object uh, not on the form form part of it, but the content part of it. And that's what science is doing. Science is focusing only on this uh, the form part of the objects. It is not focusing on the content, but it is. Science is looking for the content, uh, but it is, it is studying the form part of it. So you need to understand the, uh, the awareness part of the objects. And if you focus on that, you can live with the objects, understanding that you are still the, uh, the form, the content part, not the object part. But that's the second step. The first step is uh, direct your mind inwards whenever you have some free time. OK, so I hope that answers your question. Uh, we'll move on to Mr. Vinay Mishra, who has a question on teamwork. So, Mr. Mishra, could you please unmute and ask your question? What is your question on teamwork? Hey, Jan, thank you very much for <clears throat> uh, bringing a lot of uh, ideas about the real world and linking it to Vedanta. My question to you would be, how does mind, which is combination of experience, various signals and also the understanding in the real world of corporate organizations how do we use this particular uh, concept to bring about teamwork and try to see how we can channelize energies in one direction to achieve results uh, you know based on as we know that a lot of people are coming from diverse mind experience awareness etc and therefore, they have to see the same snake, right? Or it cannot be eye of the beholder. So uh, how, how do you uh, get this linked up, Jay? Come on. Yeah, it's not an easy, easy subject to do. The only thing you need to understand your self-core. It's very important to understand your self, uh, understanding uh, your uh, true natures, which is within you, that bulb of awareness, which is hanging around in every person. That is very important to understand. Once you understand your self-awareness is the true nature within you, then you will look at objects in a different way. You will look at objects by saying that if I get it, good enough. If I don't get it, also good enough. That doesn't mean you don't do action because uh, action is important, but the results, you're not focused on the results part of it there. So it's not an easy because if you are trying to bring everyone on the same page in the organization. So I think they need to first uh, move uh, to understand the inner core. They need to understand their true nature. Once they understand the true nature, the powers within the true nature, the attitude towards everything will change. Once the attitude changes, uh, then uh, the approach can be, uh, can be uniformed in the organization as such. But without uh, having the same uh, knowledge or the uh, inner core, it becomes difficult to bring everyone on the same page. So I think, uh, I guess, the knowledge of the inner core is very important. And also the knowledge and to understand that everything in the universe depends on the inner core there. The objects you see outside all depend on uh, the inner core. So that's very important to understand. Once you have that understanding, it becomes easier to uh, bring everyone on the same page. It's not easy, I agree, but it is uh, an, uh, uh, a task which will require uh, this knowledge to be spread around within the organization as such. I don't know if I've answered your question. Mr. Mishra? Uh, well, um, you have to, to, to a great extent, but not fully. And I think it requires a very different approach to organizations, people in the organization, how to 
make sure that their minds are more integrated in terms of uh, achieving results and how do we recondition them to, to achieve results. So I leave it at that. A lot of people would have an answer. Uh, we, we can take it up offline. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. We can talk about it. Yeah. Thank you so much. So we can move to the next person, uh, Mangesh, Mr. Mangesh Hoskote. I hope I've pronounced your name correctly. Um, he says, can we say eyes open is equal to entropy, awareness of thingness, and eyes closed is equal to awareness of no thingness or nothingness? Uh, when eyes is closed, your mind is still there. Your mind is active. Um, uh, if people who are blind don't mean they don't uh, have any experiences. Uh, they definitely have experiences. So Shatai also uh, doesn't mean that you, are, uh, uh, you have no experiences there. Um, experience, no experiences only happens in your deep sleep when there are uh, no uh, external objects and there are also no, what do you call, uh, uh, the, uh, the chitta, the dream world is also not there. So that's only state when there are no experiences there. Otherwise, finding a mind with no experiences uh, is difficult unless you reach uh, meditation to a, such a level in which you uh, meditate on, uh, uh, on one single thought and you are deep into it and you, the other thoughts are not external to you. But as long as the mind is there, uh, experiences are going to be there, definitely. And, uh, and so I think so, even when you shut your eyes, uh, it's not going to make a difference because we have audio, we have other thoughts, all will pop up in the mind. Okay. I hope I've answered that question. Mr. Hoskote, uh, have you muted yourself? You can unmute and answer, please. All right. So I don't see any. Uh, well, I, I actually meant awareness. I didn't say experience. Uh, can you repeat your question again in terms of uh, that question in terms of awareness? Uh, what exactly are you trying to say? Yeah, when, when you open your eyes. Yeah. Uh, all you see is the two-ness, the, the dvandha. Yeah. And, uh, and, and I meant I kind of, kind of compressed everything into entropy because what you see eventually leads to disorder. Yes. And, uh, and you are aware of it. Yeah. Uh, and when you close the eyes, you don't see the dvandha. You may experience, yeah, but you are uh, not experiencing dvandva. You are aware of it, yeah, but not experiencing. That's what I meant. Yeah, I so, didn't. I didn't equate awareness and experience. Okay. Uh, so awareness, you can still be uh, aware. Right now, I'm sure you are aware. You are aware of my listening. So the question is. Uh, are you aware of my words or you're aware of the awareness part of what I'm telling you? Because there are two components in this experience. One is awareness. One is my words, which is superimposed on that awareness. And because of that superimposed on my, that awareness, you are aware to experience it. But if you don't uh, have any words coming through and you focus only on the awareness part, um, yes, awareness is the ingredient of every object as such. So when you shut your eyes, um, you, your mind is still active because it has the chitta uh, memories inside. Those pop out and, uh, and those are superimposed on awareness to create an experience as such. So when you shut that chitta part of it also, that only happens in the deep sleep, uh, then uh, you still have awareness, but you have ignorance, uh, which is the only thing which is left once you in deep sleep is ignorance that is superimposed on awareness and you experience is uh, ignorance. So ignorance means you don't experience anything. So that's what happens in, uh, in deep sleep. But awareness, you can't shut off. Awareness is not like a switch. You can shut uh, on and off. Awareness is present. It's a bulb which is shining uh, every time. If it could be um, during um, what you call uh, a daytime, nighttime, awareness doesn't shut. And awareness is the only thing, real thing, it has been existing since before the universe started and it will exist after the universe exists. And that awareness is your key component within you. 
So awareness doesn't change. Awareness will not shut itself all. Even you shut your eyes, awareness part is still existing. It will not, it cannot disappear because that's your inner core. That's the only thing which is real in this universe. Okay. So I think that has answered Mr. Hoskate's question. And let's move on to the next person. That is Mr. Arun Kumar, who asks, to direct your mind inwards, how does Raj Yoga taught by Brahma Kumaris help? Uh, I'm not an expert in uh, on, uh, what you call Brahma Kumari concept, but um, there are different ways. Uh, the question is, how do you reach your inner core? Um, there are different techniques. A lot of people teach. Some people teach you need to uh, start focusing on one mantra or you focus on one image and you direct your, uh, on that focus, you focus it. But my question about all those methods is that you're still directing your mind outwards. When you're focusing on your mantra, on one single mantra, you're still, your mind is directed outwards. It's not going inwards. There's a classic example, which is given in one of the books I read. Like for example, you're in Delhi and you want to go to Chennai. You will not travel to Chandigarh and then go downwards to Chennai. You, you, it's better to go directly towards Chennai. So many of these uh, techniques which you are taught is directing your mind outwards. You're trying to focus on a single thought or single mantra or your do japam. And those sort of things are still directing the mind outwards. Uh, but your final goal is to reach inwards. So why not go directly towards inwards? Directly, why not go instead of going outwards and then go inwards, then it's directly, it's better to go direct inwards. You focus on your self-awareness. And Ramana Maharshi uh, is one of the greatest saints, according to me, and he teaches this direct path. He believes that uh, doing the japam and all those things, although good to quieten your mind, I'm not denying that fact. If you want to quieten your mind, those aspects are very important. But finally, when you have quietened your mind, you still have to go inwards towards that self-awareness, that bulb of awareness there. So uh, Ramana Maharshi always suggests, why don't you do it that directly instead of uh, trying to focus outwards and then move inwards. So does that answer your question? The screen is frozen now, Jain. Yeah. All right. So he says yes. Arun, Mr. Arun Kumar says yes. Thank you. So, uh, well, due to paucity of time, uh, we won't be able to, so do you want to take more questions? Because I don't see any more questions. We could actually, uh, what do you suggest, Chant? Would you like to wait for people to ask more questions or? They can always, uh, I've sent my email again. Yes. It's my, it is uh, at Jayanth, my first name, mm -hmm. at STAM Interactive, S-T-A-M, STAM Interactive.com. Mm -hmm. They can always ask any questions they have. Yes. I'd be more than willing to answer these questions. Yes, Mr. Ramchandran also had, uh, you know, he wanted uh, to ask. So I think Mr. Ramchandran requests you to send Jayanth your question and you all can take it on offline, okay? If that's okay with you, because uh, right now the time is 7.45. So I guess it's time for us to close the session, if that's okay with you, Jayanth. Yeah. And I just want to make one announcement that I would like to do this um, if the response, if they found this useful, I don't mind uh, doing a similar webinar on different subjects every month sort of thing. Yeah. Yes, yes. And it would be great if we, have, we would have all your uh, names and email addresses for future reference. So it'll be great if you all can just put it down in the chat box is my request to all of you. All right. And uh, a lot was spoken about and learned today. So hopefully uh, we are trying to do this as Jen said once a month so we can you can hear from us soon or you can hear from us again. And I hope this session has been good for uh, this group of curious souls looking for answers. I close the session now. And once again, thank you all for taking the time and being part of this session. Thank you very much. Namaste. Thank you. Thanks a lot, everyone. Thank you.